Thank you for tuning in to the sermon podcast from Redeeming Hope. We exist as a family of faith that follows Jesus and helps others find him by living all of life as missionaries of hope. If you want more information about our church or would like to support our ministry, go to our website at redeeminghope.org. Please enjoy this sermon podcast. If you turn to Mark chapter 7, we're going to be in verses 1 through 13 as we continue our series On the Gospel of Mark, the title of today's message is Traditions and Commandments. Traditions and Commandments. In 2013, Pope Francis announced, um, much like 500 years ago, when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of the Catholic Church, Pope Francis announced that he would be granting indulgences once again. If you don't know what those are, you can purchase through a good deed or with money time out of purgatory. So in two th- just 2013, just 10 years ago, Pope Francis announced that he'd be giving out uh, some indulgences, but only for those who followed his social media accounts. So apparently, like, you can gain, like, a couple decades or centuries out of purgatory, sort of that halfway place of, you know, punishment between heaven and hell by just following his social media account. You know, and if that's not evidence that the fall broke us in the way we approach God, because let me translate that for you. The cross wasn't enough for you. You need to add to it. Pay for it a little bit yourself. Now, nobody would actually say that, but that's what we're saying. And this is obviously an extreme example of that with something like an indulgence. But I think we think that way all the time, that I can can save myself. I can can pay for my, I can er, put God in my debt with my righteousness, or I can earn something from God. We, we would never say the cross is not enough, that we, we need to pay our own sin debt. But with things like this, that it, the ways that we think as human beings, we are bent towards self-salvation because the fall broke us. And what I mean by that is our heart's default setting through the fall of Adam and Eve when sin entered the world, we were in a right relationship with God. The Bible says there, there's this amazing relationship that Adam and Eve had with the Lord where Adam actually walked with God it seems physically in the garden in the cool of the day where there's this intimacy, there's no barrier between him and God, almost you know, this father-son relationship. But then the fall came, Adam ran and hid, and God came and said, Adam, where are you? And I think God's been asking that question ever since. Adam, where are you? So the heart's default setting got off because of the fracture of the entire universe and the brokenness of our own nature when sin entered not only the world, but entered the hearts of everyone ever born of Adam and Eve. And so the way that our heart's default setting got off is we begin to approach God in one of two wrong ways. Either number one, we run from God, like Adam, just run in terror. Or number two, we try to save ourselves. Both of them are wrong. Both of them are sinful. Both of them are a reflection of the brokenness that we have because of the fall. And here's why we need gospel-centered preaching. It gives our hearts the right setting. It puts our hearts in the right place. On one hand, we don't pretend his commands don't matter, so we don't run from God. But we also reject the thinking that God's commands exist to teach me how to fix what's wrong with me. In that sense, saving myself through religion. We see that the right setting is to see a deep, need and have a deep sense that I need a savior. So the ministry of God's law is not to justify you and I and commend us. The ministry of God's law is to point to our need of Christ. So the answer is not to calibrate our hearts to more rules and religion when we see God's word and we hear God's commands and we see God's law. It's not to ignore God, but it's to calibrate our heart to the third option, the mysterious one that was hidden for generations but is revealed in Christ, to calibrate our hearts to grace. Sin shall not be your master, for you are not under law but under grace. There's the spot. That's where we need to live. That's why we need gospel-centered preaching. We need to learn how to live under grace and approach God on the basis of grace. And grace is hard to see and it's hard to believe because of our, our fallen default settings, because they're off. And in our passage today, Jesus has a collision with some people who are just like us. They have the wrong default setting. And in some ways, I think we can see ourselves in the mirror in them. Because sometimes when we hear about the Pharisees, we're like, oh yeah, those bad guys, when actually they're a lot like me. I, I'm addicted to self-salvation. 
I feel like I need to earn God's love and earn through my performance to put myself in this relationship with God where he accepts me on the basis of that. And I think if you're honest, at least past or present is something that you've struggled with as well. Mark 7, 1, I'm reading out of the ESV, and uh, it's, we have 13 verses we're going to look at today, but I'm only going to go a chunk at a time. So let's do the first five verses. Mark 7, 1. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions they observe. Do you see that word traditions? They observe such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Let's pray. Father, help us to see um, th- this scandalous, radical, life-changing, wonderful, beautiful message, and and not just the message, but how to live it, how to draw lines from the message of grace, from the gospel into our lives, where it affects the way we think, it affects the way we talk, it affects the way we're motivated. Help us, Lord. Lead us today, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. So their hands were defiled because they're unwashed. And of course, every sister with a sibling brother in here is thinking, then my brother's defiled because he doesn't wash his hands. I know my son Jack, man, he'll be out there cleaning fish and catching toads. And then, uh, you know, half hour later, he's eating a sandwich. And then we ask the question, did you ever wash your hands? No, didn't do, why would I do that? So here we have this smear campaign that's been going on with Jesus. And it, now it continues. It's, and it's hard to have a smear campaign with Jesus because the, the guy doesn't do anything wrong. So they got to make stuff up and they found this opportunity. He violated and his disciples violated one of their rules. So they're, they're, what they're really doing is the Pharisees are looking for ways to get to God around Jesus, which many people do. We limit God to our own version of him. And the Pharisees wanted a God without Jesus Christ the Son. And that's modern America. We want to go to God without going through Jesus. And the way they do this is they try to dismiss Jesus by discrediting him because of the disobedience of his disciples and perhaps Jesus himself to one of their rules. Otherwise, it's hard to discredit him because he's sinless. So we're going to see three things here that I want to go over. Number one, the accusation. What are they accusing him of? Number two, his answer. Number three, the verdict. The accusation, the answer, and the verdict. What was the accusation? They, they being the disciples, violated the Pharisees' rules about ceremonial washings. And I'd say that we're part of the law of Moses. The problem is they weren't. They were actually extra rules that the Pharisees made up on top of the law of Moses in order to be really pure and really holy. And then they sort of imposed those rules on everyone else, even non-priests. In a sense, they're saying, well, priests are supposed to be holy in every way. Therefore, shouldn't all Jews, even the non-priests, be just as holy as us? Of course they should. So they should wash too. And it shouldn't just be for entering the temple. They should wash all the time. And all the, I mean, look at the pots, um, copper vessels, cups, couches, dining couches. Legalism always adds. Jesus plus. Right? And went through this book of Galatians years back in the, the previous church that I was teaching in, and um, we called the series Jesus Plus Nothing, because that's Paul's message. You're justified by faith alone in Christ alone, and when that's, when that's the cause of your relationship with God, faith in Christ, the effect is good work. So it's not that there's no good works, it's getting the cause and the effect right in our lives. And so faith in Christ is the cause and the effect is good works and pursuing a life that honors Jesus. But if you flip that, you reverse the gospel and you, you, do, you ravage the gospel. You do destruction to the gospel. In other words, if you flip it and say, well, the cause is my good works and then I'm justified. In other words, I re- I'm a really good person or I do my best and then the, re- the result of that is I've earned my justification before God. 
That's not the gospel. That was the Pharisees' gospel. That, this, is, this was their message. Legalists always add, always adding, putting burdens on themselves or others that the gospel doesn't put on us. Adding things to the gospel and making things issues of sin, the gospel doesn't make issues of sin, that Jesus doesn't make issues of sin. Here's what they added. Their rules. If people go out to the marketplace where they have contact with defiled people, the Gentiles, right, literally just interacting with a Gentile person, would be considered defilement to the Pharisees. They should wash when they get home before they eat so that they can be restored to a right place with God. If they're going out to eat, they should wash to keep spiritual defi defilement from entering them in case the food was sacrificed to an idol or uh, it was from an animal that was maybe unauthorized in the law that they should do the ceremonial washing before they eat their, their meals. Number three, that they'll need to wash all the plates and cups in a ceremonial way as well. Not just wash them because they need to be washed, but extra wash them so that your plates and cups will be holy when you eat off of them. Holy plates and cups. And to be extra pure, they need to wash the couches that they sit on when they're eating. Basically, baptize the couch. None of this was hygienic. It was all for washing off of sin. It was to earn righteousness. In God's eyes, and certainly in the eyes of the teachers of the law, None of this was required by God. It was all traditions of the elders. The Pharisees loved outdoing others with their obedience to rules, especially rules they made up. They made up rules on the Sabbath that were not in the Sabbath laws. Like a little girl couldn't put a bow in her hair on the Sabbath because it's a picture of being weighed down. That's work. You can't work on the Sabbath. You can't carry a stick on the Sabbath because it's a picture of work. Yeah, it's, it's only... You know, it's only a couple pounds or less, but it is, it is work. You don't want to violate the Sabbath. Extra rules, outdoing others with their obedience to their own rules or even the existing rules and their external holiness. And Jesus said elsewhere, you love the praises of men. You love to be greeted in the marketplaces. But inside, you're like whitewashed tombs. Inside, you're full of dead men's bones, even though you look good on the outside. He says, that's you. How to win friends and influence people by Jesus. There were different kinds of Pharisees, different categories of Pharisees. Just a few to give you an example of how legalistic they were. There was one, one category of Pharisees called the Pharisee letting blood. Okay? These Pharisees tried to champion the idea of not looking lustfully upon women. And the way they would do that is they would close their eyes when they're walking around in public so as not to look upon women lustfully, and they would fake collisions with walls, you know, brick, wood, oh, and they'd hit it hard enough so that blood would run down their head. And then I guess the idea was people would be in the corner going, oh, look at them. They're so righteous. They're so holy. It is beautiful indeed. And they'd receive that. That was praise that they wanted. There was another category of Pharisee called the depressed Pharisee. They went about looking down, and they would walk heel to toe, heel to toe, so as not to lift up their feet from the earth, a sign of arrogance, to lift yourself up to God when he is so holy and we are so humble, right? So they would keep their feet as low to the ground as they could, and they'd look down all the time, and they also would have collisions with people and walls, but people would collide with them, and they'd be like, oh, wait, it's a depressed Pharisee. Look at him. He looketh down at the ground, so as not to look up at the heavens. He is, indeed, Holy, right? Not holy. Jesus says, no, you're not holy. That, he says, that's sin. You're more obedient than everyone else and also more sinful than everyone else because you're, the heart setting that you have toward God is wrong. You're trying to save yourself through your righteousness. He said, how will you receive that, the praise that is from God when you seek the praise that is from men? So that's the accusation. They have all these silly, stupid rules and Jesus and his disciples broke one of them, not even in the law of Moses, and they accuse Jesus and advance their smear campaign against him. What's his answer? Oh boy. Verse six. He confronts them. He begins to confront just a few of their issues. We're just gonna look at verses six and seven. He said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Here's his point. 
you can live a morally clean life and still be far from God. Because listen, as to the law, Paul, Paul the apostle, before he was a Christian, was killing Christians. But also he was, a, he was one of these Pharisees. Um, it was actually a category of Pharisee, I can't remember what it's called, but it was, it was basically, it's translated, what is the law and I will do it. And so they were basically the experts of the experts in the law and they lived these, these pristine lives according to the law where they could literally say, I'm blameless according to the law of Moses. That was Paul. And yet he was far from God. And so his heart setting was wrong. And so the, the issue Jesus conf- confronts here is that their acts of worship, all of their washings, are surface observances, but their hearts are not honoring God in what they do. Uh, imagine it's Christmas time and your boss gives Christmas bonuses every year. Let's contrast two bosses, okay? The first boss calls you in the office and says, man, I really appreciate the work you do for us. You work hard. You're here early. You're a team player. You're valuable. And it's really been a hard year for us financially, for the company. Profits are way down. And we just don't have, literally, we have hardly anything in the bank. So I'm giving you the last $25 that we have uh, for Christmas bonuses. It's all that we have in the account. That's your bonus. I know you deserve more. We appreciate you. You're valuable. But this is all that we can do. That boss honored you from his heart, didn't he? Contrast him with the second boss. Second boss calls you in and says, I know you expect a Christmas bonus every year as part of your pay. Profits are up. And I know if you don't get a decent bonus, you might interview somewhere else. Now, I don't like giving you anything, but here's a few thousand dollars. Take your stinking money and get out of here. He honored you outwardly, and I'm sure you appreciated it, (laughs) but his heart was in the wrong spot, wasn't it? His heart was far from you. And that's what Jesus is saying about people like Paul, who Saul before he came to Christ, like these Pharisees. You worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Jesus is saying God is not looking to be paid off by your outward actions. He's looking for your heart. Paul came to Christ and he later wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. He said, if I give away all I have and deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Rule keeping actually drove a wedge between the Pharisees and other people and them and God because that's what legalism does. It hurts relationships. It hurts people. I want you to think of it like this. It was ultimately the Pharisees, the religious community, the legalists, performance-based religion, self-salvation in religion. Those were the people who ended up killing Christ, not the irreligious. Right, we get that? It was literally the people who were supposed to be looking for the Messiah and announcing him when he came. Instead, they rejected him because they didn't understand grace. They didn't, their hearts were not calibrated to the right approach to God, and they killed him. Legalists killed Christ, and legalism kills Christ in you. And I'm not saying that in a way where we, we lose our salvation. I'm saying that in a way where The joy of Christ, the life of Christ, the life of the Spirit gets killed inside of you when our default setting of our heart is like the Pharisees and not like what Jesus teaches. And you might say, well, why does Jesus care so much about their washings? And why does he, why is he so confrontational about it? I mean, on one level, it kind of seems like it shouldn't matter, right? I mean, they're just washing more than less. If you tell your kids to brush your teeth, teeth twice every day and they come up and say, Mommy, I brushed my teeth three times. That doesn't hurt anything. You're going to be like, cool. I mean, I only asked you to do it twice, but that's great. And in some ways, like the Pharisees did more than God required, but then why is that a bad thing? It's weird, right? I mean, so the guys baptize their couches before they sit in them to eat. That's weird, but it's not really a sin. It's just weird. Being weird is not a sin, and we need to learn that distinction, right? There's other churches, other movements that maybe diff- are different culturally than you are, than we are. Being weird is not a sin. I mean, I was in one church, and um, the, the lead pastor just, he, he kind of forced this 
response from people every time he said, it's offering time, we're going to pass the plate. He, he made the people cheer, like stand up and applaud and cheer like a standing ovation. And I was just like, man, this is weird. Because it didn't, didn't seem real at all. And I, I know he was so, sort of trying to get them to feel how they should about giving to God, but it just came off as weird. It's not sinful, it's just weird. I remember another church I was in, they had people come around during greeting time like we just had, but the church member, members would go around to new members and sing, look, look visitors in the eyes and sing to them. Well, I love you with the love of the Lord. <laughs> Well, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the glory of my King. And I love you with the love of the Lord. Weird. <laughs> Weird. Not sinful. Maybe we're weird. I don't know. Maybe we are. Maybe we got some weird stuff we do. We just get used to th doing things the way we do. But Jesus doesn't just say what they're doing is weird, even though it is weird. Baptizing your couch is, is, is weird. He confronts it. Why does he do that? Here's what he was confronting. These guys clearly felt like their rules mattered and gave them extra points with God and allowed them to lord their character and their place with God over other people. Made them holier than thou, self-righteous. Made them feel righteous, good, and elite. But in reality, these guys were in more spiritual trouble than anyone else in the Bible. Why? They are standing opposed to Jesus, the Messiah. The only one who could save God's people from their sins. But because they washed a lot, they didn't feel like they had any spiritual need. They had a gospel that isn't the gospel. Follow our standards or follow these standards and God will accept you. There was a blindness to their need. We have a quote here from John Owen, the Puritan. Look at what he said so clearly. Unless we are thoroughly convinced that without Christ we are under the eternal curse of God as the worst of his enemies, we shall never flee to him for refuge. Of course, my kids remind me of this all the time. One of, one of my dad quotes, the grace ain't amazing, if the wretch ain't a wretch, right? You can't sing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. If you, if you cross off the word wretch, you can't say the grace is amazing. It's the fact that we are fallen, the fact that we are broken, the fact that we can't save ourselves that makes the cross look awesome. It makes the cross look necessary. I, I want to compare the Pharisees' response to Jesus to David's when David sinned. We're just going to, read a few verses from Psalm 51 where David was caught in adulterous sin with Bathsheba and he wrote a psalm, beautiful psalm of restoration, a prayer of restoration and repentance to God. Look at how David responded to God in Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. In other words, it's not external. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. David is utterly broken and totally dependent on God. And you see this everywhere in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 6. Jesus actually referenced him when he said, rightly did Isaiah say about you. Isaiah had an encounter with God and was he boastful? Not at all. Isaiah 6, 5, and I said, woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. New Testament, Peter, Christ's disciple, 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you. Another one of Christ's disciples, James, wrote in James 4, 10, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. So, 
David and Isaiah and Peter and James said, I'm undone, I'm unclean, create in me a clean heart. And the Pharisees' answer to all this was, maybe we just need to wash the silverware and baptize our couches. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. And yet, they were blind and had this attitude toward Jesus and toward the gospel of rejection. What they needed, these religious leaders, was quadruple bypass surgery, and they thought they just needed a couple aspirin. And that's what we think we're doing when we think the good things we do make us right with God. Years back, I got a call from a businessman, a local businessman in uh, the Rochester, New York area, and uh, I think I've told this story before. Some of you may have heard me tell this. Uh, It's good to hear it again. This guy had been in church for decades. Uh, He was in this... uh, big kind of mega church down the road uh, in Rochester, New York. And um, he, he really did love Jesus and, and really did love his family and, and he loved God. But he, he contacted me and he said, I really struggle understanding grace. I don't get it. But I heard that you, like you're a grace guy. He said something like that. He said, can you, can you help me? I said, I don't know, maybe. So said, what do you want to do? He said, let's get together for lunch. It's on me. I said, great. So we went to Rochester, went out for lunch. And he said, I just, I don't get it. I see it's all over the Bible. I don't get it. And I said to him, well, let's start here. Do you realize that you're sick, twisted, and perverted without Christ? And he he just, what? I said, you, without grace, in your your sin nature, before God, are sick, twisted, and perverted. Do you get that? He goes, nobody talks to me like that. I said, the gospel does. It brings you low before it brings you high. And as we say here all the time, I'm more wicked than I ever dared believe. I'm more loved than I ever dared hope at the very same time. So the gospel doesn't leave you in this place where you sort of wallow in your, you know, in your misery of, of recognizing your sin. It says, okay, now that you recognize that, there's a savior who came, go to him. Let him lift you up and he makes you sons and daughters and you can walk in confidence before God because you're walking on the basis of Christ's performance, not yours. And I... The conversation with this guy kind of stopped there. I was like, man, this is, I think, where you're struggling. I said, I don't think you see the rabbit hole and how deep it goes, that you're still holding on to some island of righteousness in your own heart. He texted me later, and he said, man, when you said that, I was offended. He goes, but then I've been thinking about it. I can't get it out of my mind all day. He goes, There's, he goes I actually feel free admitting that. I said, that's it. It's a, my wife calls it a depravity revival. Once you realize and sort of let the gospel out you and drop your defenses and say, yes, I'm a, I'm a fallen sinner. who I fall short of God's law. I can, and not only do I fall short, I, I can't ever hope to do enough to achieve it. That's when you see the beauty of grace and the glory of the cross. And you, you start experiencing this renewal, this spiritual renewal. The Pharisees' righteousness only looked good when they compared, they compared themselves to others but they failed to use the right standard to measure their righteousness, which is God's perfect holiness. Because I think what ends up happening is people kind of take God's law and they go, how am I doing? You know, we used to ask this two-question test in evangelism, like if you died right now, would God accept you? And no matter what people say, yes or no, you say, well, why? Why why do you feel that way? Like 99 out of 100 Americans say, yes, God would accept me. And... um, Really what we're doing is, when the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So people kind of look at God's law like this, like it's achievable. Yeah, how am I doing? Uh, pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. When in reality, it's more like, it's more like this. This is you, me. We're actually down there. And the law of God is supposed to make us go, <gasps> right? That's why Paul said the law of God stops every mouth and keeps people from justifying themselves. It's a tutor. The Bible, Paul said that the law is a tutor to lead us to Christ. Again, so the teaching of the, God's law is not for us to go, I'm good. It's for us to go, oh no, I need grace. But if we judge by comparison, you know, I'm doing pretty good. I'm pretty good. Let me have... Uh, let me have Wyatt and Jack come up in the front here. Yeah, come on, you guys. Little, little demonstration. 
Okay, so you guys stand right here. We're going to have a jumping contest. I know Jack has a torn ACL, okay? We keep him in prayer. He's going to have surgery soon. But uh, we're going to have a jumping contest. So you guys stand right here. Okay, face this way. Right over here. Face this way. Good. There we go. Now, you're going to jump that way, okay? Now, before you jump, the rules are you have to be able to jump all the way across Clarksville, all the way to Fort Campbell, or you're disqualified. We get it? Ridiculous, right? Impossible. Here's the thing. I'm fairly certain that Wyatt would be able to outjump Jack right now, okay? But does it really matter if the standard is Fort Campbell? Does it matter that he can jump a little farther than Jack with a torn ACL? Thanks, guys. It doesn't matter. And the Pharisees were guilty of comparing, well, I'm more righteous than them. I'm obeying more laws than this person. And at this, this spiritual comparison created this blindness to God. Now, last week, if you were here, we saw that the disciples, when Jesus was walking on water, the Bible says they had a hard heart. So they had this spiritual sickness called hard-heartedness. We see a different kind of spiritual sickness today, legalist, legalism, but also comparison syndrome. Nothing will make your life as cold and unfruitful as pursuing some kind of gospel substitute that makes you okay compared to others rather than believing the gospel. So do we trust some external rule to follow? Here's how it plays out in very mundane, practical areas of our lives. Um, I'm doing well because I have a clean house. I'm good because I'm a good mom or I'm a good dad. I work hard. I make enough money. I pay my bills and I don't cheat on my taxes. I spend enough family time. I eat the right food. I provide for my family. Not the gospel. But our hearts tend to lean on our own rules or preferences in order to make us feel, by comparison, closer to God than others. So Jesus' answer to the Pharisees was, number one, he first criticizes surface-only obedience that drove a wedge between their hearts and the hearts of God. And number two, he criticizes their arrogance for putting their commands on the same level as the commands of God. Look at verse seven. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. This is some form of self-worship. It's a grab at glory. Say, God, get out of the way. I'm I'm gonna step into the sunlight of your glory. I deserve a little praise here. The The pharisaical attitude was, God is awesome. He's awesome. But you know who else is awesome? Me, me and God, we're both awesome. This arrogant self-worship, believing that God's commands didn't go far enough. So let's create some of our own. As an aside, I want you to see how high of a view of the Bible Jesus has. We see Jesus quoting Isaiah. And in other places in the Bible, you see Jesus saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. And I just want to kind of put a footnote or have this aside just for a moment here to say when we minimize the Bible, we actually minimize Jesus. In our day, there's a lot of attacks on the Bible. Well, I like Jesus, but I don't like some of the Bible. That's rejecting Jesus and his view of the Bible because the Bible drove him. Even when he was on the cross in his dying hour, you know what came out of his mouth? Scripture. John Piper said, Jesus is greater than the Bible, but if we lose the Bible... We lose Jesus because we lose the biblical Jesus. Okay, so just, just a note on the Bible there. Back to our regularly scheduled program. So how do we get there? What, what happens if our hearts drift toward becoming our own authorities like the Pharisees or drift toward legalism or drift toward, you know, this kind of works righteousness? It can be very subtle. I think two things that can happen are, number one, we create extra biblical convictions from God's commands. For example, the Bible teaches us to be good stewards. That's good. Jesus had a parable about being a good steward. The Bible teaches that. But then we elevate our application to the level of God's commandment, and we do all kinds of damage. We tie our conscience to a command that it doesn't need to be tied to. And our whole image is tied to our application of the commandment, be good stewards. For example, you see this all the time with extreme dieting. Cut out all carbs, all sugars, all fats, meals, desserts, and fast food. Everything else is poison. If you eat that stuff, you're eating poison. That's, uh, that's legalism. Because you've now made something righteous. The Bible doesn't make righteous. We've got to be careful when we say stuff like that. Now, I'm not saying it's not a 
good way to approach dieting and good food and bad food, but at the same time, we have to be careful not to create division in the way we think or talk about that or condemnation. It's good to have rules, but if they aren't the Bible's rules, you need to make sure you can break them or you're struggling with legalism. Got to be able to break your own rules that aren't biblical rules. Don't go trick-or-treating or wear a costume on Halloween. Don't have Christmas trees. Don't watch rated R movies. No, I don't... We shouldn't be thoughtless consumers. We got to be good stewards in our home and our families. But I, for me, for years, not watching radar movies, that was a thing. And the Passion of the Christ came out, right? It's radar. Or other good movies that are virtuous and have, you know, good topics and maybe had some bad moments in the movie. And I had this legalism and I thought I was, oh, you, you did? I can't watch that because I, I don't watch radar movies. See what I'm doing? I'm applying my application of maybe a good principle in a way that is legalistic and creating division and self-righteousness. So we create extra biblical convictions from God's commands. Number two, we make our rules binding on others. So we start to subtly look down our nose who don't follow our commands and we feel superior to others. Oh, you ate at McDonald's? You are a Christian, aren't you? We start to quietly judge people, and that rips the body of Christ apart. It happens with church cultures, too. Years back, there was a, a famous preacher in New York City who said Christians shouldn't have TVs. And he did this very dramatic thing where he, he shot his TV with a shotgun, and then, therefore, everybody in his church and everybody in his movement started shooting their TVs and not having TVs. Well, you know, of course there's wisdom. We have to have wisdom with what my mother would call for years the idiot box, right? But again, that's, that's imposing a standard or a preference or a conviction that I have on somebody else in a way where it becomes legalistic. Wearing ties or not wearing ties. For years in different church movements, playing cards, dancing, not drinking alcohol. I know we're in, in, in the South here and and I know there's, uh, there's a lot of preaching against the evils of alcohol, and we need to be careful. But I think we also see in the Bible that it is a conscience issue, that Christians under grace have a liberty to make your decision in faith. And it's, I don't have a right as an elder to command your conscience in that area. But we need to be careful and loving and not parade our liberty. At the same time, we can become legalistic about this. You know? uh, even prayer meetings, in my experience, have been turned into legalisms. My wife and I were part of a church and. In uh, Fort Worth, Texas, for about a year, we were in music ministry. They, they said, come to our church. We, you can have an office in our church, and you can be part of our church. And we're, we're experiencing revival. And we got there, and they were having prayer meetings every night of the week. And frankly, it was exhausting. And it became political, where if you're at the prayer meeting, you're righteous, and you get it, and you want revival. If you don't go to the prayer meeting, you're compromising, and you don't want revival. And so they turn, literally turned prayer into something that sowed division and death in the body instead of sowing life. It can happen with anything. It creates snobs. Finding a standard that you keep and can judge others by and then feeling smug and superior when those around you don't keep the standard. And really it's, what it is, it's all self-worship, this comparison syndrome, comparing ourselves to others, Let's compare ourselves to Jesus and then we'll just be broken and rescued instead of smug and superior. But we can do even greater damage than just becoming snobs. We can develop traditions or ways of doing things that contradict the commands of God and follow our own rules instead, which is what these guys did in Mark 7. Verse 8 says, You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. This is pretty sharp language. He says, you've rejected the command of God. It's the same word for divorce. For divorce. And he's telling Bible teachers, you've divorced the Bible. You're divorcing the Bible. And he says it in the harshest way possible. You have a fine way of divorcing God's commands. You know what you're really good at? Sinning. It'd be like saying to someone, you're awesome at being lazy. You're an expert liar. And then he gives an example. Verse 10 through 13, the, the end of our text. Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father and mother will most surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things that you do. So Corban was a, a, a Hebrew 
you know, Jewish uh, principle. And it was basically a sacrifice or an offering made to God in fulfillment of a vow, and that's good. But what was happening was the Pharisees were saying, oh, if it's Corbin, if you sell your property and it's Corbin, you need to give it to us, not your, your parents, if they're aging. But what happened if your parents were older and you needed to provide for them? If you sold the farm just to try to help them pay the bills, and the Pharisees came in and said, that's Corbin. The right thing would be to honor your parents and to love your parents. And the Pharisees were sweeping away, uh, getting rich off of this idea of Corbin at the expense of people who were hurting in the community. So they worked a loophole in the code to justify the disobedience of their hearts. And Jesus is saying, their tradition voided the word of God and the greater law of love. Okay. When traditions become dangerous, number one, traditions are more important than Scripture. Number two, those holding to traditions begin to defend the indefensible. Number three, traditions become issues of sin and righteousness that the Bible doesn't make sin and issues of sin and righteousness. Number four, people are persecuted for not keeping the traditions. And number five, traditions become the gospel. All of this shows how religious sins are just as wicked in the eyes of God as irreligious sins are. Tim Keller said, repentance isn't simply repenting for our bad deeds, but our damnable good deeds and depending on them to be accepted by God. Okay, and finally and briefly, the verdict. What was the verdict of all this? There was a judgment that did result from this and other conversations with the religious leaders. Later on in the Gospel of Mark, they found Jesus guilty of breaking their laws and they sentenced him to death. But in taking this judgment in himself, he took the judgment for us and the laws we did break, though he actually broke none. Colossians 2, 13 and 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And in that, Jesus paid for the sins of religious sinners and irreligious sinners. Isaiah 40 says, Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain laid low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places plain. You know what Jesus, you know what Isaiah the prophet's talking about there? The haughty, prideful, religious sinners will be humbled by the gospel and the lowly, you know, law-breaking sinners will be lifted up and encouraged by the mercy of the gospel and everybody ends up on the same ground before the cross. Jesus on the cross said, It is finished. What is he saying? That was the same phrase used by tax collectors, masters, and foremen in that day. So when a debt was paid, a tax collector would say, it is finished. When work in a field was done properly, the master would go out and look at the field and say, it is finished. When a house was built, the foreman would come and look at the house and the structure and say, it is finished. Listen, when Jesus said it is finished, the debt was paid, the work is done, the house is built. Now we simply believe and receive his grace and enter into a new calibration of our heart with God. We relate to God on the basis of grace and Christ's performance and not self-salvation and our own performance. Thank you for listening. We gather every Sunday at the Clarksville area YMCA. For more information, please go to our website at redeeminghope.org.